Hard landings, how do we fix this, all right? Three things here I'm gonna share with you that you should be aware of. This video motivated by uh, recent events in the industry that have all been caused by hard landings. Uh, this video, as I said, being motivated by that as well as other initiatives that I'm getting involved in now to keep our, our skies safe and uh, all our crew trained well. Um, with that being said, you guys know the name, Joe Munoz, OneStepPrep.com. Let's look into this. There's three things I'd like to share with you that relate to hard landings. And mainly what I find with hard landings is, of course, it's a, a late flare uh, or no flare at all, but certainly a late flare attributed to three primary things. This video, mainly I'll share with you these three things, these three concepts are relevant for all pilots and especially you transitioning from the GA world or even from turboprops into swept wing transport category jets. First thing is what I just said, the swept wing. It brings about a different pitch attitude, a little bit of different um, uh, dynamic in terms of the flare, which we're going to look at. So the swept wing is the first thing, and we're going to talk about that in detail. Second thing is the flight deck height, and the third thing is the foot per minute rate of descent that you have on the approach. You can also throw in things such as the thrust vector effect, the startle factor. I'm going to talk about all this now and hopefully provide some clarity and improve your landings in the process. Swept wing. For those of you that have flown a straight wing, this is any training platform like a Cessna 172, a Piper Warrior, and it could even be a turboprop like a Metroliner that I used to fly, or a Saab 340 or an ATR. Anything with a straight wing. It flies real good slow, not so good fast, but because it flies good slow, it doesn't need slats. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Your swept wing jets like 737 or A320, they fly great fast, I and mean, most swept wing jets do. That's the reason for the sweep, to prioritize that speed. But they don't do well flying slow, and so the manufacturers have to uh, d basically p enhance the low speed maneuverability by installing high lift devices such as leading edge devices. Now the leading edge devices, or slats in this case, that come out on the leading edge of the wing, similar to the trailing edge flaps, but only now they're on the leading edge, slightly different but similar if you think about it this way. Basically this brings about a slightly different pitch attitude on the approach, a slightly nose high pitch attitude, and in fact, transport jets, if you look at them, even in level flight, for you to maintain 5,000 feet, you're not going to fly the horizon, you're going to fly slightly nose high. That comes into play on the approach. You'll notice a 7.3 or an A320 or really any jet with slats, leading edge slats, has a nose high pitch attitude contrary to jets with no slats like a CRJ200 which is more nose down or your uh, uh, straight wing ATR, again, more nose down. And so that sight picture difference does play into the sight picture you're going to see on the flare and also the fact that the engines are mounted under the wing you have this thrust vector effect, which simply says if I add thrust, the nose comes up, and if I reduce thrust, the nose comes down. Now in the flare, we of course reduce thrust, which drives the nose down. And so one of the things you have to be mindful of is when that thrust reduction happens in the flare, that that nose may come down slightly because of the thrust vector effect. And not only are you going to have to nose up because you're flaring and because to counter the thrust vector effect, but also you may have to nose up a little more than what you anticipated because the sight picture is different because of the swept wing and the slats. You're going to be seated higher than you anticipate by comparison to your straight wing airplane. Now sitting higher is also the second thing that I brought up, so let's talk about it. For those transitioning from a smaller plane into a transport category jet like a 737 or an A320, you're seated higher, which means you have to flare higher. And so a lot of times I see pilots from the GA world transitioning to jets flaring low because of that first element we talked about, but also because the sight picture where they're used to initiating the flare is just so much lower by comparison to one of these transport jets. Now the third and final thing is the foot per minute rate of descent. Remember that a three degree glide path, which is most approaches that we fly, or a three degree glide slope, is effectively five times your ground speed. So if you're doing 70 knots of ground speed in a, in a light airplane, you're gonna need about 350 feet per minute rate of descent. Now let's imagine for a moment you're in a 737 or an A320 doing 140 knots of ground speed. Uh, you're going to need upwards of about 750 foot per minute rate of descent. It's basically twice what you're used to approaching the runway at. And so with that being said, it's important to note or to consider that, hey, the pitch attitude is different, I'm seated higher, and the runway is coming up faster, which means I need to flare sooner, and I need to anticipate a considerably different sight picture than what I'm used to. Now, 
imagine the very first time you flew an airplane, the first time you came into land, you to some degree may have had uh, a little bit of a, a shock or startle factor of like, wow, I'm actually doing this and I'm landing an airplane and the runway's approaching. And did you feel very fluid in your approach and flair and landing? Probably not. And the startle factor basically says that our human psychology, when we um, see or detect a threat, we may have a few seconds of effectively freezing. Now, I would say having a considerably different sight picture uh, with all these aerodynamic factors that maybe you weren't expecting if you weren't properly briefed and a runway coming up at you twice as fast uh, is going to lead to a potential quote-unquote threat that may contribute to a lack of fluidity in your flare. And also, by the way, if you don't flare and smack the runway, all of a sudden that impact could be felt as a threat and you have a momentary uh, freeze up, if you will. And so ultimately the point I'm getting to is that it's important to note between the pitch attitude difference and the thrust vectoring effect and the fact that you're higher off the ground and the fact that your rate of descent is considerably higher, your flare needs to initiate sooner. But I would very much be thinking in your mind as you approach, similar to an approach, I'm always thinking I'm gonna go around, similar to a takeoff, I'm thinking I'm gonna reject. On the flare, you need to be thinking flare. You need to be thinking and proactively kind of um, having understanding that, hey, this is going to happen faster and sooner than what I anticipate. Reps is ultimately what is needed. Repetition over and over. In a simulator would be great. In an airplane, just getting out there and flying, of course, is always advisable. But ultimately, uh, it starts in the sim. It starts with good instruction. It starts with you having an environment where you feel you can engage with many, many reps, which really starts from the instructor uh, cultivating this and, and cultivating a good training environment for you to be able to put that practice and reps together. So with that being said, hopefully this makes sense. Hopefully you can take something out of it and apply it to your landings and see that they um, increase in smoothness and in your fluidity to be able to grease them on each and every time. We'll see you around.